Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, good morning to you all. My name is Sunil Nathre, Transformational Life Coach, NLP Practitioner and Clinical Hypnotherapist. It's uh, uh, expressing a very warm welcome to all of our viewers today. And uh, we have another fantastic um, uh, podcast with you with my very special guest, Mustafa Sazmaz, who is, uh, uh, in, my, in my view, a prominent thought leader and philosopher. So uh, let's say good morning to you, Mustafa. Hello, good morning. Hello, Sunil. Good morning to you too. Good morning. And I'm, I'm probably our, our viewers have probably noticed that uh, on this occasion, uh, Mustafa is not viewable on video. Uh, he has been a very, very busy man of late. Uh, he's recently moved house in London and uh, he's just waiting for his broadband to be connected on Monday. But he, I said, Mustafa, are you sure you wanted to do the podcast? He's so committed, he's so motivated and dedicated and devoted in this area of work. And then he said, well, well, well Sunil, there are phones, I can dial in. <laughs> so here he is. So, uh, so, he, so Mustafa will be listening to my content uh, and, and then uh, there will be time for Mustafa then to provide his feedback on the information that I'm presenting in this podcast. So I'm thrilled that you're here, Mustafa. You are juggling a thousand balls at the moment, and I'm so grateful for your time. So thank you so much for joining us. It's obviously a lot of people love your feedback, and I'm so glad that you're here today. Fantastic. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, then. Right. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to introduce the topic for today, and we are looking at, uh, I mean, our series, our podcast series that Mustafa and I put together uh, is about aspects of the mind, mastering the mind, understanding different elements within the mind that can help to empower us, to help us grow, to help us transform, to help us learn, to help us change, things that we were not aware of previously but through podcasts like these, people will then start to think maybe a bit differently about things, about themselves, about other people, about organizations, about absolutely anything. Because absolutely everything goes through our conscious mind. Then it gets processed and then eventually it'll then, some of it will go in our unconscious mind, some of it will stay in our subconscious and then it will then go back into the conscious. There's this constant activity going on in our mind between the conscious mind subconscious mind and the unconscious mind that podcasts like these are helping everyone hopefully to illuminate the subject to to a much more greater deeper um kind of level so people can then have better understanding hopefully make better decisions and choices um just start to awaken just start to wake up about things and um and and you know, you know, we are all learning on this planet. I mean, it's been, what, now 12, 13 weeks? We've been in lockdown here in the United Kingdom. And, I, I, and my learning has grown exponentially in the last 12, 12 weeks in many different areas of life. And, um, and you know, I was joking with some of my educational colleagues this week because I, I obviously wear different hats. And one of my hats is educational work. And uh, we were all saying, my goodness, haven't we all learned a lot about digital technology? And, um, and we've been really using our broadband Wi-Fi like anything. So I can, I can only imagine how Mustafa is, is, is basically dealing with no broadband. He has to wait for a few more days until he has it all installed in his house on Monday. But then I was joking with my educational colleagues and I said, my goodness, I feel like rewriting Maslow's hierarchy of needs that actually underneath the first layer which is physiological needs around eating food having clothing having shelter but if we have those basic needs met we can then eventually work up towards self-actualization meeting our potential but then for me I said well I would put a layer underneath the physiological and I would put digital technology I'd put Wi-Fi, broadband. Let me just ask my, <laughs> my colleague, Mustafa. Mustafa, would you agree with me on, my, on me reshaping Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the theory of motivation, that we need to have digital technology underneath physi physiological? What do you think about that? Well, well you, you, you feel naked uh, when you don't have it. 
<laughs> exactly. If something goes wrong with my broadband and I'm with a webinar with 30 teams, I'm thinking, oh no, this is, this is, this is terrible. This is the end of the world. <laughs> my heart just drops. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay then, Mustafa. So, Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that, that was a little bit of a joke that I came up with. Um, sorry, please excuse me, viewers. I, I do have a sense of humour, so I hope you can <laughs> bear with it. Uh, I do like seeing the funny side of things. And again, laughter and humour are actually acknowledgement of, of, of some information or some fact or some notion or concept. So for me, I, I think having a bit of humour does kind of keep the day interesting and it just helped with learning as well and awareness raising so so yes yeah, so i i am going to be writing maslow's hierarchy of needs and say this is sunil's new um theory of motivation we've got to have the digital otherwise it's just game over <laughs> especially during these very precarious times that we are living in where there's lots of lots of people you know there's i think i think broadband figures have gone up like anything I think a lot of people are now on broadband and people who were, were not before are having to, to, to have broadband in their house because they can't, they can't communicate with other people. They can't go shopping and all sorts of other things as well. Okay then, right, right, jokes to one side. We're now going to begin the podcast. So for the next probably about 30 minutes or so, I'm, gonna de I'm going to uh, deliver some content now around a very important topic. This, this topic is a real speciality of my staffers. It's something that... Um, I've always been aware of, um, but he really uh, heightened my own understanding of semiotics. Okay, so we're going to be talking about semiotics. What, what is semiotics? The role of semiotics? And obviously, I'll go through some practical applications um, of semiotics uh, as well uh, in, in everyday life, in, in professional uh, spheres as well. Uh, but it's a topic that is really uh, of great interest to my colleague Mustafa, so I'll be very, very keen to get his feedback on this. Um, so, so let me begin then. Okay, so with semiotics then. So semiotics is a study of the use of symbolic communication. That's basically what it is. It's a study of using um, things that we are very, very aware of, signs, logos, gestures, and other linguistic and non-linguistic communication methods. Now, as a word, semiotic derived from the Greek word semiotikos, which describes the action of interpreting signs, okay? Now, at this point, you're thinking, my goodness, there are signs and logos everywhere. That's brilliant. Then you might, then my other question is, well, start thinking, why do you think they have created the signs like they have? Is there some purpose behind the way they've designed this logo or the coloring or the size, okay? um why why they have done things in a certain way well we're going to be looking at these things in more detail because the signs are there to trigger something inside us for us to then maybe uh evoke some emotion maybe in the, and as, as we know thoughts equals emotions emotions then go to decisions decisions go to actions consequences good bad or otherwise so maybe the signs have some kind of a role in this psychological flow that goes through all of us in our minds, okay? So, the field of semiotics focuses on understanding how people create and interpret the meaning of signs and symbols, including how people visually communicate through things like metaphors, analogies, uh, symbolism, and other means of expression. Okay, now at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share with the viewers some slides, which I think people will find very, very helpful. And I'm just gonna go into a screen share now and just go straight in there, okay? So I'm just, so basically Mustafa, what I'm doing, my friend, is I'm, I'm going to go through three to four PowerPoint slides. And for your benefit, my friend, I'm going to explain each one clearly as if you're seeing them, all right? So then, then obviously when you do your feedback, then you'll be able to feedback back on the slides as well as my commentary. All right, everybody. Okay, now what I've got up is I've got my first slide up and basically it's a very basic uh, uh, kind of um, cyclical diagram. And on the left-hand side, it's got the word signifier. Then towards the right, you've got an arrow going from signifier to signified. Then from signified, then you've got an arrow going down to the sign, 
and then basically that's that's what you've got so you've got signifier to signified you've got signified to the sign at the bottom and then you've also got signifier going down to the sign now let me explain what each of these mean all right signifier is the actual word or the image now one example could be a diamond for the for the very for the very you know purpose of giving you an example and, and an illustration uh, you know, a signifier is a word or an image, and it could be a diamond. All right. Now, let's now move on to signified. Now, here we need to understand what does this image signify? Okay. So, if, what is it associated with? So, we could use some NLP. This sign is associated with. Okay. What is it associated with? Now, it could be wealth, it could be romance, it could be class distinctions. It could be about food, it could be about feelings, but it, it all depends. Our interpretation is going to be based on how we see that signifier. Okay. Now, at the bottom, we've got the sign. Okay. The sign is the outcome or the meaning gained. Okay. So, for example, if if proposed, if if proposed that it is, uh, you know, for example, we, we may make an association that, ah, right, for us, diamond equals wealth. Diamond equals romance. Okay? So this is, this is how we make meaning. This is how we make meaning from words and symbols. Because everything that we see, our, our subconscious mind tries to interpret it and makes meaning out of it. So then it becomes comprehensible, understandable, it becomes clear to us. The thing is, if we don't make meaning from something, we'll just probably leave it in our unconscious mind. Remember, our unconscious mind is our hard drive. It stores everything, absolutely every memory, everything that we see or hear is stored in our unconscious. And it may well be that if we don't understand the sign and the symbol, then the unconscious will store it and then maybe later on it might be triggered by something through the conscious mind that, ah, right, I understand it now. It makes sense. Or maybe somebody else has explained it. So, for example, if I see a sign that I don't understand, I might ask my friend Mustafa. I mean, I might forget about it. Then I might ask him in a conversation. He said, Sunil, it's like this. Then, then basically by him telling me, I'm activating my subconscious mind and I'm pulling out the fact that, ah, this symbol didn't have a meaning attached. Now I'm going to allow my subconscious mind to make the meaning out of it. Now I understand it. Now I know what I can do with it if I want to do anything with it. Okay? So that's the first slide. And also, it's very important when we're talking about semiotics that we draw a distinction between these two very important concepts. One is denotation, which is spelled D-E-N-O-T-A-T-I-O-N. And the other one is connotation. So I would call it, you know, connotation versus denotation, okay? Because almost every single word or every single symbol, it has two kinds of meanings. One, which is a straightforward, literal, explicit meaning, okay? So a diamond is a diamond. Like, for example, a diamond is, uh, you know, like a rock, isn't it? It's a rock or a stone or it's, a, you know, it's an item of jewelry. Okay, so that would be the denotation, interpretation of that thing. However, connotation is different. This is about the ideas or feelings associated with the word. And connotation is dependent on our interpretation of the explicit item. And, and the connotation will vary from person to person how they perceive it, based on their background knowledge, what they see, what, what they've been told about it, how they see it literally through their conscious mind. So with connotation, this is more about implicit. This is more about inferential meaning, okay? It's, the, it's, it's what does it suggest to you, okay? Denotation is what does it state? What is it, what is it actually? So this is like looking in a dictionary. So if you want to learn about denotation of anything, look in the dictionary and you'll find exactly what is the explicit meaning of this. However, connotation is our own understanding. And it's quite interesting to note because I'm a language teacher as well. And it's quite interesting that, you know, over many, many years, some classic standard words have changed their meaning over and over and over again. People 
through their own experiences or their own observations, they have attached different connotations. And sometimes those connotations become very popular and things becoming much more popularized through social media that then it becomes like a part of our discourse, part of our narrative, the way we always speak, for example. Um, and, and, and therefore it becomes connotation, okay? And, and hence, I sometimes wonder why, like the Oxford English Dictionary, they have, they have, they, they're always every quarter, they're coming up with new words because people have created them or they have redefined words because people have adopted them in certain ways now. Okay, so this is really, really interesting. For example, the word media, I'm sure the word media, uh, maybe 20 years ago, is a lot different to what media means now. Media is everything. Media is social media, it's Facebook, it's Instagram. We didn't have such de definitions um, in those days. Um, so this is about denotation and connotation. Okay, so that's the second slide. The next slide, I'm just gonna go through some quite specific examples of words which um, go into the denotation category and those which are into the connotation. So what I've done here, Mustafa, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, six words on the denotation, which you can look up in the dictionary. And then on the right-hand side, I've got the connotation of those literal words, all right? The first one is under denotation is dirty floor, okay? Now, what is dirty floor? Now, we know what a dirty floor, there, there's dust and there's, and there's, uh, there's, there's, there's muck on the floor, there's this, that, and the other, and it needs cleaning. However, what is the connotation? Now, it may well be, if you see that image, it may well be, well, this is a very unclean environment. Maybe someone has a very bad lifestyle. Um, maybe there, there's something uh, not quite appropriate about living in a, in a house. You know, maybe this person hasn't got good hygiene. Maybe they couldn't afford a cleaner. Maybe they don't, they don't like cleaning. So all the things I'm saying now, these are all connotations to what has been denoted, which is the dirty floor. The next one is expression, okay? Now somebody um, freely expresses themselves, okay? Expression, expression means to freely express, to freely talk, whatever's on your mind, you express it. But then the thing is, if somebody one day becomes very, very expressive and they're not normally expressive, then the connotation of that could be, oh my God, are they on drugs? Are they drunk? They, they don't normally express themselves like this. So this is really, really important um, in terms of, in terms of uh, information there. Okay. Also, you know, I'm just giving you a very cl classic example. If somebody, if somebody shows you an image of underwear, for example, yeah, you see underwear, you know, against an article or something, then yeah, I mean, it is, you know, what we wear, okay, every single day, all right? However, what is the connotation of that? People might think, oh, underwear, is it about sex? Is it something rude? Is it about prostitution? Is it about strippers or whatever, or escorts and things like that? So again, that is something to bear in mind as well. Also, if you see an image of like bare feet, you know, I don't know, bare, bare feet on the street. So what does that mean? Obviously someone's not wearing shoes, but the connotation could be, maybe they're, they're, they're not wealthy, they can't afford shoes. Um, maybe they have a free, a free spirit. They don't want to wear shoes. They, they, want, they, they want to feel the ground. They just want to be free. They don't want to be constrained by wearing shoes because that, that is, their, that, that is their, their own values. They're the way of life. Okay, so those are some examples there of how we can um, clearly show the distinction between denotation of certain items and their connotation, depending on people's interpretation. Now, what I'm showing here now, I've got two more slides. This slide here has, is showing some very, very popular logos, okay? So I've got one here with the big M for McDonald's. I've got the thing that looks like a tick, which is the Nike one, just do it. You've also got the Starbucks, which looks like some, a lady wearing a crown and she's got her arms up and it's a green logo. You've also got the Apple logo as well. Now I see the lack of, I see the Apple logo every all the time because I've got an Apple MacBook, I've got an Apple Mac as well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I might be getting an Apple phone this year. <laughs> so again, you've got the Apple logo, and you've also got the Shell oil logo as well, which is like the shell, the shape of a shell, which is in yellow insert. Then you've got the the, the red border. Okay. So again, now for me, um, 
if I'm driving and I and I'm driving from from say uh, I don't know Wolverhampton to London and I see the M sign and I'm hungry, I say yes, right. M means food. Um, M means you know to satisfy my my kind of um, you know my hunger. If I see the Nike sign, if I go to a shop. I may not necessarily associate Nike with clothes. For me, it's a very powerful, um, you know, for me, there's a very powerful message of just do it. So every time I see the Nike uh, kind of logo, then it motivates me to do something, not necessarily to buy something, but that's my interpretation. But my son, 23, he sees Nike sign. He wants these shoes. He wants that tracksuit bottom. Blah blah blah. It's a different kind of. Everyone's got different um, interpretation to it. Okay, and for me, Apple. Obviously, one person's interpretation of Apple might be quality. Might be you know you know you know really good product. For me, it's about work. <laughs> Every time I see an Apple logo, it reminds me. Ah, I've got my website to update. I've got to do this podcast next and that podcast, and I'm going to be using my Apple. So my Apple logo. <laughs> and then I've got another slide here, final slide here, um, which has other very famous logos. Like, for example, you've got BMW. Whenever I see a, B a BMW logo, I always think of quality cars, not, not just different types of series of BMWs, but quality cars, okay? Um, I see things like, you know, Coca-Cola. I've got, like, the Coca-Cola logo for Matt. For me, uh, that, 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 for me, my interpretation is when I used to love drinking cola when I was a child. So Coca-Cola then takes back to my childhood. Not necessarily that, that I want to drink a Diet Coke right now by seeing that, but it somehow takes me back in time in terms of how, it, how I interpret that. Okay, right. So that's just a very, very short kind of, um, uh, just a, some few slides there with regards to... Um, my kind of my little take on um, semiotics in terms of the logos and things. So I'm just going to go through a bit more commentary now about semiotics. Really, you know, as I mentioned before, it's an investigation into how meaning is created and how meaning is communicated. It's, its origins lie in the academic study of how signs and symbols, be it visual, linguistic, <coughs> meaning. It's a way of seeing the world and a way of understanding how the landscape and culture in which we live has a massive impact on all of us unconsciously. Now, one of the modalities that I, I, I actively work in is education. I'm an education consultant and trainer. And I use semiotics all the time within the scope of visual literacy. So if I want my learners to understand a piece of text for their English course, and I know they're going to have trouble understanding it, I will try and pull out uh, certain <coughs> diagrams, certain caricatures, um, certain images, uh, charts, uh, cutaways, nets, anything which like flow charts, I will show anything visual to trigger their schematic knowledge, their pragmatic knowledge, some information about what this means to them in their own world, for them to trigger some understanding which may help them to form a hypothesis of what the text might be about. And if I can get them to predict what the text might be about by using a semiotic approach to teaching, like showing visuals, then they form a hypothesis which they then have to approve or disprove once they get the text. And I may not show the whole text altogether because it depends on the learners. I may just show the title or the, the first bit or whatever it might be. But hopefully the hypothesis formation from their semiotic knowledge is going to help them to motivate them to read the text. So I like to use semiotics as a motivator through prediction um, to help them form a hypothesis for them then to be able to either prove or disprove the hypothesis when they get the text. Because a lot of the learners I work with, they have trouble reading. And that's why semiotics uh, around the context of the text, I mean, the text could be about McDonald's, the text could be about fast food, so I'd use the big M sign. I'd use the M sign to get them started to have, have a discussion. And boy, oh boy, will they be talking about McDonald's opening up and queues of people wanting, um, you know, their, their Big Mac because they've been denied it for three months because of lockdown and things like that. So people have a lot to say about that. And also, um, you know, other examples is like the different colours of a traffic light. Now, for me, I use traffic light systems for teaching in terms of assessment for learning. I want to know 
what if whether learners can understand this is it a green light are they struggling is it an amber or do they have no understanding red light so for me every time i see traffic lights on the road yes i know what they mean but it also triggers me to think about am i also making sure i'm checking that my learners are understanding what i'm teaching them so for me it has a dual purpose so you know the sign uh, which is there it can actually help to deal with unconscious cultural knowledge to help understand its meaning okay and and viewing and interpreting and decoding this sign enables us to navigate the landscape of our streets and society and the world so by saying that by saying that everybody decodes everybody is a semiotician so please regard yourselves everyone listening and watching as a semiotician you are all engaged in the art of semiotics, okay? Because everyone is constantly, unconsciously interpreting the meaning of signs around them, from traffic lights to colors of flags, the shape of cars, the architecture of buildings, and the design, even the design of cereal packaging. Even the way, I mean, wh why do we have so many choice of typefaces and fonts? So every time I, um, create instagram posts i create thumbnails for youtube or my website imagery i i will then go to the text and there's so many different types of text it depends what mood i want to create you know nice soft curvy lines handwriting style official official dumb. there there is a type of text that is suitable for that particular purpose and, and i want to create that I want people to know this is a serious text, so I'll use Times Roman font. No, I want them to know this is a very easy to the eye piece of text. It's about leisure, it's about relaxing. So I won't use Times Roman, I'll use something else. I'll use Calibri, I'll use some other kind of uh, font, maybe handwriting font, okay? So we know, for instance, that, the, that, you know, that you know, maybe particular signs in certain cultures, they may have different meanings, okay? Now, you can see me now putting my hands together. So, you know, for me, that is like, you know, uh, in my culture, it's like namaste. Namaste or sastriga means, means welcome, hello, in a very respectful way. But maybe somebody seeing somebody putting their hands together, they may interpret, they may interpret that, oh, that person's into yoga, um, or this person's into meditation or this person is spiritual, or they're into peaceful living, okay? Um, also, you've got the emojis, haven't you, on the phone? So you can put attach emojis, like clapping of hands or high five, and all these have different meanings for different people, depending on what you want to do. So semiotics is part of the broader study of communication, and, and it transcends into all areas, like visual art, graphic design, even basic visual literacy like the examples i gave you that i use to help my learners to learn to read text appropriately so you've got professions like graphic designers artists and other people working in visual communication who always consider the power of symbols and signs and colors to affect the interpretation of their works so we might sometimes say well you know if we see some light red color does that mean something is urgent? It's, does it mean that it's something that is quite negative? If we, seen, if we see light cyan color, is that about calm and serenity? Um, you know, when I teach GCSE English, I like to use colors to teach different metaphors and adjectives. So though my learners have a range of different words in their vocabulary to then have an impact on, on how they want to write the, for the impact of the audience. So for me, use of colors is very, very, very uh, important. And I'm sure if you look on Pinterest or Google Images, if you put down the meaning of colors, then you'll then find there's like charts of colors, like red is this meaning, green is that meaning, amber is this meaning. And it's, complete, it's a complete um, minefield, really. But it just goes to show the power of color. And people like you know, who are graphic designers, people who are designing websites, they are very, very aware on behalf of their client what kind of impact the client wants with the public by use of color, by use of imagery. This is all semiotics, it really is. So for example, it's really important for a graphic designer 
to create a logo for a company that's not only eye-catching and memorable, but also communicates the impression the company intends to make on its customers. And for example, you know, if you're, if you're in the business of, if, you're, if you have your own business, um, if you have somebody working on your website, if you are developing your own website, you, you, you've got to be aware of the impact that the information is going to have. And I'm always updating my website. I'm always having colleagues like Mustafa or the people I collaborate with saying, Sunil, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Have you thought about changing this color? Have you thought about the change of the writing? And it's all semiotic work. It's all because we want to make sure that the information gets across clearly and communicates the message that, you know, for me as a transformational life coach, I'm, I'm here to help you. I can help you. I can help you to get results. And I have to be honest with you, when I started my online journey, I was not really aware of the power of semiotics. But, you know, eight months on, I definitely am. And I'm still learning. It's definitely an ongoing learning curve for me. So we can look at the example of advertising. Okay, companies aim to properly communicate their brand essence or their targeted demographics, the people they want to target by understanding how individuals from different locations interpret communication. This is also done with a cultural um, frame of mind as well, because, you know, international companies will always try to change their, their visual imagery, their logos and colors to meet different needs of cultures. It may well be that anything red in China is gonna work. In India, anything white, amber or green is gonna connect. So it's things like that that are very, very, very important, very simple, very powerful. And so depending on the context, symbols vary in meaning as well. So for example, thumbs up, you know, can have various meanings when used in different situations, like in a conversation. For example, you know, thumbs up could mean I'm fine, I'm okay, don't worry about me. In a teaching context, if I ask people to do a thumbs up, it means that they understand it. If they don't understand, then they're going to do a thumb sideways like this. If they don't understand, they're going to do a thumbs down. I actively encourage my learners using an assessment for learning strategy to show me, show me how you're feeling, okay? Then I understand, then I know. Because some learners may, may feel reticent to express themselves, but they'd rather show you, and then you can then go there, and then you can then ask further question, all right? Now, the thumbs up, you can do this in every day of a situation in your own relationships, you know, with your children, with your partners, with your friends, you know, if they find difficulty to express themselves verbally, then the non, the, the sign, like the thumbs up, could, could do the trick, it really could. Now, businesses use semiotics to successfully communicate with people who speak different languages using visuals that often translate uh, easier, easier than, than in text. Now, why do some companies put information in other languages? Because they want to target other people that, ah, oh, look, if they put something in Russian or something in uh, German, then they're obviously attracting that demographic, that, uh, that, that clientele, and then that clientele from German say, oh my God, this, this is a very German focused company. They are really looking after German needs. So I'm gonna click on their website, okay? So it's very cleverly done. And this is how businesses really use semiotics to their advantage. So, you know, semiotics can also negatively impact a business as cultural preferences can shape whether the population likes or dislikes a brand. Okay, like I said, maybe in one country, a particular color may not suit another country particularly if the countries don't get on with each other. So they're gonna be really careful they don't unwittingly offend people. Okay, so in other words, we need to understand the context in which a sign is communicated in or to comprehend its real meaning. It's about meaning making and hence act appropriately. So what is going on around the sign is usually as important as to know as the sign itself in order to interpret. So it's gotta be about the context as well as the actual sign. And that's really important. For example, the actual diamond, you know, if the diamond was represented in a backdrop of opulence, then they could be talking about diamond is to do with wealth building, okay? But if the diamond was in the middle of a couple who are about to kiss, then diamonds are about romance. It all depends on how it's presented. So semiotics is a key tool to ensure that intended meanings um, are unambiguously, unambiguously understood by the person on the receiving end. It's always about, semiotics is used to communicate something. It's a communication tool to get your message across. So there are good reasons if someone doesn't understand the real intention of a message, 
And semiotics can help unravel that confusion. And that, that's why I love using semiotics in teaching. Because even though I'm teaching English, you can't always ask people to read and write to learn English. You've got to use other ways to get the meaning across. And for me, yes, semiotics, imagery, meaning, okay? Sometimes I would like them to listen to something or watch a video or play games or do matching activities. You know, something which is more kinesthetic. I want them to get the meaning and then we can move into the, the actual nitty gritty of doing the, the text work or reading comprehension or whatever. Now, semiotics started out as an academic investigation of the meaning of words in linguistics. Then it moved into examining people's behavior in terms of anthropology and uh, psychology. And I'm thinking of the work done by Margaret Mead in the 1950s in Western Samoa, where she examined people's behavior as to the things they handled and the things they, they did with certain very basic primitive objects. Now that then involves, semiotics then involved uh, to become an inquiry into culture and society. So that, that's where you had subjects like sociology and, and also philosophy getting involved in semiotics. And then following that is then moved now into assisting with the analysis of cultural products like films, literature, art, critical theory, and also finally and more recently becoming a methodology for carrying out research and analyzing consumer <laughs> behavior and brand communication. So you can see now how semiotic transcends all aspects of our lives and throughout life history and world history as well. So businesses, I'm, I'm gonna be finishing off shortly before I get my colleague to comment now, but businesses apply high level thinking of semiotics to enable clients to understand the commercial implications of the culture around their brands and its impact upon customers. So ultimately businesses can assist with the development of culturally relevant brand strategies through meaningful communication in terms of their, you know, what is their branding? What, what images and logos and signs are they using? Um, are they using sounds or lack of sounds to communicate imagery? Uh, are they using video stills? Uh, you know, are they using animation? All this is part of a semiotic way of trying to communicate with someone. So there's not always one way. And in terms of how it links up with the mind, could it be that a very simple thing I want to leave with people who are watching this uh, before I hand over to my colleague for a discussion, but could it be that how we could use semiotics to, uh, to improve our lives is, are we doing, are, are we, are we um, having enough are we giving enough due credence to the power of signs and symbols that we see and we hear every single day of our lives? Could it be that we could interpret uh, a more diverse meaning of things that will help our general understanding? Are we just seeing things in a, in a certain fixed way that is not really how it should be interpreted fully? And can, can we then start to use our subconscious mind to start looking at things differently? So we get the full power of something. We get the full power of what a sign is intended to communicate. And also, can we also use semiotics to become better human beings? Can we become better communicators? Can we become better parents? Can we become better partners, better uh, business people? Can we become better teachers? Can we just improve our general nonverbal, verbal communication skills by having a better understanding of semiotics? Can semiotics help us to monetize more effectively? Can it help the way we brand ourselves as people or as businesses? So a huge, huge, huge area of work, but this was just a very basic kind of an introduction. Now at this point, I'm now going to hand over to my colleague who may completely disagree with everything I've said, and that's absolutely fine. We're having a discussion here. So Mustafa, I'm gonna hand over to yourself, my friend. Thank you, Short thank you, Sunil, yes. Yes, uh, it's wonderful to listen to you, and uh, it's uh, what you have done so far is you, you laid the basics uh, framework for semiotics. Um, I mean, I studied semiotics uh, for my uh, master's degree, incidentally, yeah. and it is it is a kind of minefield, to be honest. Mm. Um, but the semiotics. Uh, is a late subject. I mean, uh, together with uh, sociology and uh, linguistics, yeah. um, 
and psychology uh, of 19th century. Mm. Uh, Semiotics came into being in uh, after the um, prominently after the Second World War. Mm. But uh, semiotics uh, on its own is uh, is perhaps a limited subject. Uh, it's only when you combine semiotics with the subjects like NLP, uh, sociology, um, uh, social anthropology, then semiotics become a very sharp tool for us. Mm. Mm. Um, just before I go any further, uh, I want to say, um, as humans, we are meaning creating and meaning con consuming uh, creatures. Mm -hmm. We create meaning, we consume meaning. Uh, we, we create meaning and we consume uh, meaning uh, too. Mm -hmm. So semiotics is a, is a marvelous uh, tool for us to become culturally more aware. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Given the fact that culture uh, is is a is a um, is a mechanism of uh, meaning creation, for example, in one culture, let's say um, wearing uh, red uh, on Sunday is uh, not uh, frowned upon. On the other culture, it may be uh, applauded. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because what the co color uh, 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 connotes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, what this tells us is uh, uh, semiotics is a very, uh, uh, very much contextual meaning we derive from uh, uh, whatever uh, visual thing we have. Yeah. Is, uh, it depends on the context. Yes. Uh, uh, if I give an example of this, really? I studied Dorim Cathedral's door, what it meant, uh, the insignia in the door. Yeah, to New Zealand and Australians, uh, yeah. New Zealander and Australians, as yeah. opposed to French and German, hmm. as, when they uh, visit northeast of uh, England. Yeah, uh, I was at university in Newcastle, and yeah. I did my uh, um, <clears throat> master's degree for tourism management on emblems and logos, and yeah. I studied Durham Cathedral's. Uh, symbol uh, that is uh, on the uh, door, yeah, which obviously uh, represent 900 years history at the time. Now it's 930 years almost. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, semiotics is 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 a very um, fascinating subject. Yeah, uh, it also helps us to to break a uh, notion of myth into its elements. It's like yeah. uh, breaking atom uh, into molecules. Yeah, that's what semiotics helps us ah. to understand the meaning, meaning of uh, meaning of uh, the, the the task we have at hand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the semiotics, uh, we need to go into deeper and understand yeah. vertical and horizontal study yeah. things. Yeah, and now uh, so much uh, uh, branching out within semiotics, like. Uh, uh, Semiotics of algebra of uh, computing, for example, is one area. Uh, you know, uh, uh, semiotics uh, also helps us um, break down the uh, components and elements in advertising, uh, visual or uh, audio. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is. It is. It is. It uh, is. It is interesting, uh, to be honest. Uh, yeah. But I. Uh, <coughs> I use semiotics to attack uh, certain established ideas, like, uh, for example, religion, mm. uh, and it is a great tool to uh, to break religion again into its components. Mm. Uh, religion uh, semiotics is a fantastic tool. It's like a toolbox you have in your hand. And yeah. Uh, yeah. You first, open the uh, the bonnet of the car, and mm. then uh, you start dismantling certain things. Yeah. Uh, sem yeah. Semiotics is also part of uh, uh, um, discipline within, uh, sorry, in philosophy, uh, uh, the area called structuralism and deconstruction. Yeah. And these are the subject areas that uh, that all happen to come or crop up after the Second World War, mm -hmm. as we become uh, more uh, existentially aware of our our yeah. being in yeah. this world. We 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 started seeking a, a meaning of life, uh, and looking at it from many different uh, angles, mm. and that is um, 
in that semiotics plays a role, yes. Uh, semiotic pl uh, semiotics play a role there. And, and also, uh, I wanted to ask you about, uh, uh, you, know, you know, like sentimental value, you know when people have a sentimental value of a family heirlooms, it could be a necklace, that's just a necklace, but it has so much meaning. Can this be interpreted as... Oh, well? yes. Well, uh, well, this is... <laughs> This is this is great. Yeah, good good example. But uh, uh, well, I <laughs> I'm really skeptical about such things like that. <laughs> sentimental value of stuff. <laughs> it is it 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 is uh, it is irrational. It is irrational. And that's an example of not the not educated, the irrational example. side. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because but you see, you see your your connotation of someone's necklace. Someone's neck could just be a necklace, but somebody else's. Uh, there may have a huge connotation to it that this is yes, my grandmother, yes. and this is uh, my only memory of my grandmother, for example, and so it can be hugely impactful. Well, I uh, I agree with that, uh, but uh, I am more of uh, uh, thinking about the pompous side of things uh, that uh, people buy uh, on wedding anniversaries and in other uh, on other occasions, yeah. Yeah. such uh, such gifts. Yeah, uh, it, it to me it's all always have a double meaning, uh, mm. to say the least. But but yeah. something from something from grandmother is is is, is obviously it is precious. It's the full stop. No, because uh, it has it had been bought uh, and hand over through a number of generations mm. uh, uh, for the value uh, of family uh, life and and. Uh, uh, our grandmothers weren't as skeptical as us today in our uh, in our, in the world we live in. Yes. So their intention was uh, their intention was totally for uh, the together togetherness of uh, the value of family. Yes, and this is semiotics. The, the comment I'm making right now is semi totally semiotic. Amazing. Uh, really good. But comparing it with today's uh, um, gifts of. Uh, uh, necklaces and stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> I, I can be a bit brutal there. <laughs> no, that's fine. But can you? Can you? I mean, just 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 because we're kind of coming toward the end of the of the podcast, is there any kind of advice you can yes. give to the viewers as to? Because obviously you have yes, but it's yes, it's to you know to you know great depth, and I and I have to respect your knowledge and your wisdom about it, but. Is there any uh, advice you could give to no. how they could use semiotics uh, in their in their lives to help them with cope with difficult yes. or become better learners? The, anything really? Yes, very broadly. I, I mean, it is a complex subject. Very broadly, what I can say is this: uh, the external world we uh, we face we live in in our external uh, paraphernalia or the yeah. our life in our lives mm. we need to uh, we need to uh, as if we are cutting the knife mm. uh, how do you cut uh, uh, our uh, our our um, observation of external world in, into two just cut it into this is the other side is non sacred. It's yeah. In in um, uh, one one side is religious, the other side is non religious. This is how we how we uh, create meaning in the first place. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this this would then uh, ha this would then help us. Uh, what is religiously related, but what is non-religiously related to our life? Break more more stuff into their meanings and the, their uh, components. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but th th this this all happens within context. You yeah. at the beginning you your uh, your uh, um, uh, chart which shows the sign sign signifier and signify. This is very good. Uh, yeah, this needs yeah. to be applied, but it, yeah. it is it is using semiotics is a is a kind of activity back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, uh, it is back and forth, isn't it? You yeah. know, but, yeah, it is all right. vertical and and uh, and uh, horizontal. The, 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 <laughs> most of things to consider. And one one thing one thing I say you may disagree because you interpret it slightly differently. But uh, on the uh, on the whole, 
there is fundamentals to semiotic interpretation in order to uh, not to diverge from the uh, actual meaning and it, it is it is a useful tool yeah it great is a useful tool. That's I, great. I mean the one of the, one of the one of the most famous adverbs i can uh, 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 recall is one is uh, hello boys the wonder bra advert <laughs> the second is nicole papa uh, you know it was <laughs> it was quite uh, unbelievable uh, and then the, the, uh, the last one is a social uh, social uh, advert which was yeah. the man was smoking uh, it was a campaign against smoking mm. the man was smoking and the woman was uh, preparing uh, her meal he, his his meal but she was slim and aged however attractive mm. the man was at her age but was uh, uh, a bit sloppy uh, sort of you know and eating and uh, ch eating chips drinking beer smoking yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. and uh, yeah. and l later uh, when it comes uh, when it came time to go to bed the woman was waiting with expecting expectancy uh, that they want to have a sex yeah. but yeah. The man was already out because he drank so much, smoked so much, <laughs> and eat patty food so much. So that is another <laughs> another uh, platform to uh, to apply uh, uh, to learn semiotics, uh, application of semiotics. I mean, you know, it, because they are uh, interesting subjects, and yeah. they are also uh, to some frightening aspects they have. But it, it takes you um, into psychology, doesn't it? it re semiotics, it, yes, takes you straight yeah. into yeah. psychology and how the mind interprets things and then what interpretation you give it how you how it makes you feel how you you then make a decision it's very very powerful i mean advertisers use it very cleverly don't they to get you yes. to, to hook you into yes. something to, to to together together with other other subject areas like nrp uh, semiotic is a wonderful wonderful uh, tools a yeah. set of tools that yeah. anybody can use you don't need to study deep it's yeah. only you need to learn uh, certain things yeah. uh, to understand uh, yeah. uh, the application. Fantastic. And uh, I think, uh, I think, um, uh, uh, Sunil, you you have a, you you started very well with with the, uh, with, the, with the theories, which is uh, complex and difficult, and you simplified this. Uh, I think uh, in the next step, we if we put in context, if we study some yeah, adverbs uh, in the podcast, do that, in another that, segment. that could yeah. be that yeah. could be more beneficial the audience yeah but we definitely will I, I suppose this was more about introducing what it is that people have never heard of the word before but now they're more familiar then we can definitely look at some more practical examples of how it's used and how it can be used okay mustafa so that brings us to the end of the podcast thank you so much indeed and uh, and and thank you viewers for for watching and please do leave your comment in the comments box if there's anything you would like further information on from myself or my colleague Mustafa, I'd be more than happy to help. So we will now um, be closing down this podcast, but please do look out for the next podcast in our Mastering the Mind series. So we bid you all farewell and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.